Hello, everyone. In this lecture, I want to talk about the famous Earthrise picture taken by the crew of Apollo 8 on December 24th, 1968. Shown here isn't the picture that people typically think about when they think of the Earthrise picture. However, this picture is the first picture taken as the crew was coming into view of the Earth after having traveled behind the moon. They were not instructed by NASA to take the picture. No one had thought of it, but the crew thought that this was a special opportunity and started taking pictures. This was the first time human beings saw the earth from the moon with their own eyes. The background for this picture begins in about the second century. I want to thank Professor Nimali for introducing me to Lucian's work and she has a book that is coming out soon called The Moon in the Greek and Roman Imagination. Lucian was from Samosata, which is part of modern day Turkey. He was a Syrian who was around in the second century. Not a lot is known about Lucian, but some of his works have survived. A particularly relevant work is a true story, which is possibly the oldest science fiction work. While the work is called a true story, Lucian makes it clear that he's lying. He starts a true story by saying, I shall at least say one thing true when I tell you that I lie and shall hope to escape the general censure by acknowledging that I mean to speak not a word of truth throughout. Later, he says, I give my readers warning, therefore not to believe me. In the story, the protagonist is on a journey by ship when he states, about noon, the island being now out of sight, on a sudden, a most violent whirlwind arose and carried the ship above 3,000 stadia, lifting it up above the water from whence it did not let us down again into the seas, but kept us suspended in midair. In this manner, we hung for seven days and nights. If it wasn't clear that Lucian is writing fiction, for reference, 3,000 stadia is about 475 kilometers, or 300 miles. You might want to know where 300 miles is above the surface of the Earth. On the right is a diagram that shows the different layers of the Earth's atmosphere. Note that 300 miles is about the same height where the International Space Station is orbiting the Earth. The ship that was carried up is transported to the moon where the protagonist finds people living there. In these quotes, he's describing what people on the moon are like. Amongst them, when a man grows old, he does not die, but dissolves into smoke and turns to air. They all eat the same food, which is frogs roasted on the ashes from a large fire. Of these, they have plenty, which fly about in the air. They get together over the coals, snuff up the scent of them, and this serves them for victuals. Their drink is air squeezed into a cup, which produces a kind of dew. They have honey here, which is extremely sharp and when they exercise themselves, wash their bodies with milk. This mixed with a little of their honey makes excellent cheese. I must, however, inform you that they have eyes which they take in and out whenever they please, so that they can preserve them anywhere till occasion serves and then make use of them. Many who have lost their own borrow from others, and there are several rich men who keep a stock of eyes by them. One of the really interesting things is when he turns around and sees the earth. It's written, that spot, he told us, which now looked like a moon to us, was the earth. This is one of the oldest thoughts about getting the opportunity to look back at the earth from the moon. And note, this is from the second century. The main event of a true story is a war between the people of the sun, called Heliots, and the people of the moon, called Selenites. They are fighting over who has the right to colonize the morning star or Venus. The story describes the war in some detail. It said the defeat then becoming general, many of them were taken prisoners and many slain. The blood flowed in such abundance that the clouds were tinged with it and looked red, just as they appear to us at sunset. From thence it distilled through upon the earth. It continues, The conquerors, determined not to besiege the city of the moon, but when they returned home, resolved to build a wall between them and the sun, that his rays might not shine upon it. This wall was double and made of thick clouds, so that the moon was always eclipsed and in perpetual darkness. The two sides eventually come to an agreement, and the treaty stated that the Heliots shall demolish the wall now erected between them, that they shall make no eruptions into the territories of the moon, 
and restore the prisoners according to certain articles of ransom to be stipulated concerning them, that the Selenites shall permit all the other stars to enjoy their rights and privileges, that they shall never wage war with the Heliots, but assist them whenever they shall be invaded, that the king of the Selenites shall pay to the king of the Heliots, an annual tribute of 10,000 caskets of dew, for the insurance of which he shall send 10,000 hostages, that they shall mutually send out a colony to the morning star, in which whoever of either nation shall think proper may become a member, that the treaty shall be inscribed on a column of amber in the midst of the air and on the borders of the two kingdoms. Seeing this conflict between two groups of people fighting over a third place, reminded me of another conflict that was happening in the mid-20th century. At the same time as people were traveling to the moon, the United States and the Soviet Union were in battle over the third place, Vietnam. The Vietnam War was horrific, with the total death toll being between about a million to four million people. The famous Earthrise picture was taken by Apollo 8 in December of 1968. So to put that picture into context, let's take a look at some of the things that were were going on in 1968. I want to warn you that some of the pictures in the following slides are very gruesome. There were many things going on in 1968. Just Google year of protest and the first result will likely be about all the protests that were going on in 1968. I'm not going to cover most of these protests since I have limited time, but please spend some time learning about all the protests that happened in 1968. If you've seen the HBO miniseries From the Earth to the Moon, they had an episode episode called 1968. The episode was largely about Apollo 8, but they tried to give the viewer some context as to the events going on in the world that year. This lecture was inspired by this episode. I will mention some of the events that they showed, but I'll also mention events that they didn't. One of the major events at the beginning of the year was the Tet Offensive. It's named after the Tet Holiday, which is the Vietnamese Lunar New Year. During the holiday, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese People's Army of Vietnam charged against the South Vietnamese Army of the Republic of Vietnam and the United States Armed Forces. While the Tet Offensive started on January 30th, it continued for months, becoming a major turning point in the Vietnam War. On February 8th, three black students were killed by police on the South Carolina State University campus in Orangeburg, South Carolina. The students were Samuel Hammond Jr., age 18, Delano Middleton, age 17, and Henry Smith, age 19. The students were protesting against racial segregation at the All-Star Bowling Lane. On February 12th, South Korean Marines killed between 69 to 79 unarmed people in the villages of Phong Ni and Phong Nat in South Vietnam. Then on February 25th, South Korean Marines killed 135 unarmed people in the village of Ha Mi. On March 16th, United States soldiers killed between 347 and 504 unarmed South Vietnamese civilians, including men, women, children, children, and infants. 26 United States soldiers were charged for the massacre. One soldier, Lieutenant William Cowley Jr., served three and a half years under house arrest. I would like to remind you we are still discussing March of 1968. It doesn't get better. There are a series of individuals who died. On March 27th, Yuri Gagarin, the first person to go to space, was killed when his MiG-15 airplane crashed. Yuri is pictured on the left, and a MiG-15 airplane, like the one he was flying is shown on the right. On March 28th, Edson Luis de Lima Soto was killed by the military police in Brazil for protesting against high prices of meals at a restaurant. He was 18 years old. On April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. On the same day, the uncrewed Apollo 6 launched. On April 7th, the legendary British racing driver Jim Clark was killed during a Formula 2 race in West Germany. On June 1st, Helen Keller, who was an author, a political activist and a lecturer died in her sleep. On the picture on the left, she is holding a doll as her teacher and Sullivan looks on. Helen Keller is also pictured on the right. Robert Kennedy, the brother of John F. Kennedy, was shot on June 5th and died the following day as he was in the midst of his presidential campaign. On August 20th, five Warsaw Pact countries, Soviet Union, Poland, Bulgaria, East Germany, and Hungary, invaded Czechoslovakia. In the process, 137 Czechoslovakian civilians were killed. Between August 22nd and 
30th, the Democratic Party National Convention took place in Chicago. There was chaos both inside and outside the convention. Inside the convention, Hubert Humphrey was contentiously nominated as the Democratic Party's nominee for president. And outside the convention, there were anti-war protests. In mid-September, the Soviet Union launched Zond 5, which was the first time living things traveled to the moon. Inside the spacecraft were two Russian tortoises, as pictured on the top right. The stamp on the bottom right commemorated the mission. The Soyuz 7K L1, or Zond, shown as an artist's rendering on the left, was the Soviet Union's equivalent to the Apollo spacecraft. The plan was to send two cosmonauts to the moon at the end of the year in this spacecraft. On October 11th, Apollo 7 launched. It was the first human launch of the Apollo program. The crew shown on the right consisted of Wally Schirra, Don Isley, and Walter Cunningham. The launch of the rocket is shown on the left. Notice that this is a smaller rocket than the Saturn V. This is the Saturn 1B rocket that was capable of putting the Apollo spacecraft into Earth orbit, but not powerful enough to send it to the moon. After the men's 200 meter race on October 16th, during the Summer Olympics, Tommy Smith, who won gold, and John Carlos, who won bronze, raised their fists in a black power salute during the national anthem. For this act, they were both expelled from the Olympics. Smith is quoted as saying, if I win, I am an American, not a black American. But if I did something bad, then they would say I am a Negro. We are black and we are proud of being black. Black America will understand what we did tonight. If you notice, each one has one glove on. John Carlos had forgotten his gloves, so Peter Norman, who won silver, suggested that they each wear one glove. For his support, Norman was criticized when he returned to Australia. In 2006, Smith and Carlos were pallbearers at Norman's funeral. On December 21st, Apollo 8 launched. Pictured on the right is the first time humans flew on a Saturn V rocket. It was the first time humans went to the moon. Pictured on the left is the crew, Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders. Apollo 8 went behind the moon, and as they were coming around, they noticed the Earth rising near the moon's horizon. They scrambled to start taking pictures, and this is the first one that they took. Once they got the color film ready, they took this picture. This is the famous Earthrise picture taken on December 24th, 1968. Given all the events that happened in 1968, someone sent a telegram to NASA stating, thank you Apollo 8, you saved 1968. This is about where the HBO series stops, its episode on Apollo 8 and 1968. This is often used to almost say, see, space exploration is good, it was able to even save a horrible year. Just because of Apollo 8, just because of a single picture, I like to show a letter that Frankie Boyce, who is from New Jersey, wrote to his father on December 30th, 1968. He was a musician, but he was drafted in April of 1968 and sent to serve in the United States Army in Vietnam. He wrote, I am spending New Year's in the woods. I hate this. I wish I could have spent New Year's home with you and mommy. They really hate colored people over here. I had to beat up a white boy the other day for calling me the N-word and talking about my mother. Pop, since I got the record player, if there is some record you want me to hear, you can send them. Tell Richard to keep sending me all the latest records. Richard is Frankie's brother. I won't spend next New Year's in the woods. You can believe that. Frankie was right since he was killed on January 20th, 1969, at the age of 20. Why do we like things like You Saved 1968? Perhaps this quote from William Howells helps. He said, What the American public always wants is a tragedy with a happy ending. 1968 was 1968. It is absolutely beyond ridiculous to say it was saved by Apollo 8. What about this picture? If it didn't save 1968, what did it do? Many things have been said about it. For example, it is credited with inspiring the environmental movement. Please take a few minutes to look at this picture and think about what it means to you. Perhaps Carl Sagan's famous words about a similar picture of Earth would help. This is a picture taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft when it was about 6 billion kilometers or about 4 billion miles away from the Earth. This is what Carl Sagan said about the pale blue dot picture in 1994. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religious 
religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. This is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Going back to the second century, let's look at another work of Lucian. This time, Icaromenophis, where the character Menophis is discussing his trip to the moon with a friend. I expect to hear a great deal about the form and figure of the earth and how it all appeared to you from such eminence. Menophis. When I first looked down, I could not find the high mountains and the great sea, and if it had not been for the Rhodian Colossus and the Tower of Pharos, should not have known where the earth stood. He continues. I beheld clearly and distinctly everything that was doing upon the earth, not only whole nations and cities, but all the inhabitants of them, whether waging war, cultivating their fields, trying causes, or anything else. Their women, animals, everything, in short, was before me. You may conceive what a strange medley this appeared to me. It was just as if a number of dancers, or rather singers, were met together, and everyone was ordered to leave the chorus, and sing his own song, each striving to drown the other's voice, by bawling as loud as he could. You may imagine what kind of concert this would make. And yet, such, my friend, all the poor performers upon earth, and of such is composed the discordant music of human life. The voice is not only dissonant and inharmonious, but the forms and habits all differing from each other, moving in various directions and agreeing in nothing, till at length the great master of the choir drives every one of them from the stage and tells him he is no longer wanted there. Then all are silent and no longer disturb each other with their harsh and jarring discord. Above all, I could not help smiling at those who quarrel about the boundaries of their little territory and fancy themselves great because they occupy a Sisonian field or possesses that part of Marathon which borders on Oanoa or are masters of a thousand acres in Arcana. When after all, to me, who looked from above, Greece was but four fingers in breadth. When I looked down upon Peloponnesus and beheld Sinuria, I reflected with astonishment on the number of Argives and Lacedaemonians who fell in one day fighting for a piece of land no bigger than an Egyptian lentil. When I saw a man brooding over his gold and boasting that he had got four cups or eight rings, I laughed most heartily at him, whilst the whole Pangesus, with all of its minds, seemed no larger than a grain of millet. Think about how from the 2nd century to the 20th century and continuing into the 21st first century, many of the same things are discussed by two people living 18 centuries apart. They talk about how we humans fight over things that are insignificant and cannot get along with one another. This picture didn't save 1968, but it does continue to scream for all of us to take care of one another. Below is the barren land of the moon, and surrounding the earth is just the emptiness of space. The hope is that in the 38th century, they are not talking about ongoing war, hatred of certain groups of people, 
rule, accumulation of wealth, and many of the other blights of the 2nd, 20th, and 21st centuries.